The infamous Eager Beavers and their custom B-17 bomber, old 666 by the Fat Electrician. Now, this has been requested of me to react to a number of times. As I said, I'm trying to space out Fat Electrician reacts, specifically newer ones, because I want to make sure that when he puts out a new video, because these do take time to edit, to upload, to, you know, I want him to be rewarded for putting in all that effort. And reacting to it is fairly easy, in my opinion. So I want to make sure that the first several days, you know, he has the ability to have his video as the sole variant of it in the algorithm, and I'll react to it at, you know, a later date. Uh, absolutely love reacting to these. Just want to make sure I'm doing so ethically uh, as well as I can. Let us get into military engineers. This is a story of a B-17 pilot and a bombardier, two anti-heroes that become best friends and assemble their bombing crew out of a bunch of misfits that don't fit in anywhere else, and they become adamant on doing things their own way. So much so that the U.S. government won't even give them a B-17 to fly. They uh -huh. then proceed to build their own and become the most heavily decorated air crew in U.S. history. Today I'm sorry. You won't give us a B-17? I'm... I'm going to go over here and make my own B-17. <laughs> We're talking about Jay Zemer, Joe Sarnofsky, and their air crew, uh -huh. the Eager Beavers, the most decorated air crew in U.S. history, responsible for completing the most decorated mission in U.S. history, all while flying the most heavily armed bomber of World War II, Lucy, a.k.a. Old 666. Wow. This video is brought to you by Warwood Tool, makers of the original American entrenching tool from World War One. And while they're not making entrenching tools anymore... God, I actually haven't looked at an entrenching tool in a hot minute. That is... That is painfully efficient. I love that design, actually. They are making sledgehammers and axes, and they're making them using the same drop hammer forging techniques that they Fair. used back in World War One, right out of West Virginia. Wait, drop hammer? I've seen that shit. That shit's cool. Drop hammer forging is legit. If you need a tool for the rest of your life, check them out. This video is also brought to you by LAS Concealment. Full disclosure, I originally turned them down as a sponsor because I've done several holster making companies before, and I just uh -huh. think it's disingenuous to have a bunch of sponsors for the same type of product. So I said no. Despite that, they decided to send me a holster anyways for free, and it actually ended up becoming my favorite holster and the only one I've been carrying lately. That actually looks really cool. And I do agree with the fat electrician on this one. We're like... And I'm the same way. I've had companies reach out. I've had entities reach out being like, hey, Kip, we, we would like to sponsor you. Would you like to do a thing? And, you know, my first thing is always I would like to see the paperwork, please. You know, I want to make sure that I have all the expectations, terms and conditions, etc. I, I need to know what I'm looking at, which like 90 percent of them don't even respond to that. <laughs> but also like, yeah, absolutely. It's like I I get it where if, if I were to promote a, uh, you know, a single holster type, right? Um, or even then say if Beretta for some reason was like, Kip, we want to sponsor you. We heard you like the Berettas. We want, we want to sponsor you, right? Like, oh my God, that'd be amazing. But like, it's not going to happen, right? It's just <laughs> Beretta's a big, big company. Um, right. And then suddenly Springfield or Colts like, hey, Kip, we'd like you to sponsor me. And it's like, I get it. It feels like there's almost a conflict of interest. And like, I, so I totally get where he's coming from. And the fact that LAS was willing to send him, hey, like, look. We get where you're coming from. Let's just send you this holster. See if you like it, right? That is good business integrity. That is an excellent marketing strategy. So moving forward, they are going to be the only holster sponsor of the channel. I need a corporal. You're it until you're dead. I'll find somebody better. <laughs> I wonder if I could get LAS to make me a holster for my sledgehammer. Yes. Yes, they would. 100%. Anyways, back to the video. Starting off with our pilot and main character. All right. Marines, engineers, rednecks. How many cans of beer is it going to take to make a holster for the sledgehammer? I'm guessing at least three to four. Dr. Jay Zemer, born in 1918, he grew up in Pennsylvania with a pretty wealthy family. For high school, he was sent to a military boarding school in Culver, mm. Indiana. While there as a freshman, despite the school's policy on no students having vehicles, he managed to acquire a Willie Motor <laughs> Company Whippet, the direct predecessor of the Jeep. And he managed to turn this thing into an absolute hot rod, better than it ever ran before, until the school finally found out that a yeah. student had a car, which is against the rules, so he had a disciplinary meeting with the dean. He goes into this meeting with the dean, and he's like, look, I'm in the engineering program, I'm taking all the engineering classes, I want to go to school to be an engineer, I just rebuilt a motor, and I'm 14 years old, you guys should treat this as extra credit. To which the yeah. dean, being cool, is like, well... Take me for a test drive, and we'll see. Takes God, that Dean. Oh, my God. <laughs> that is incredibly reasonable, actually. Oh, my God. <laughs> see, we already have people in chat. <laughs> One case in an afternoon for that holster. 
not have a nerf hole, so that holds my sledgehammer no problem. <laughs> Promise a keg for everyone involved, and that hole will be made by tomorrow morning. <laughs> Take our jeans, a staple gun, and some zip ties. <laughs> See, this is it's perfect. See, it just it writes itself. <laughs> you know who to talk to. I keep saying the Marines, the engineers, and the rednecks. They'll get it done. Whatever you need, you just got to provide the beer. <laughs> to Dean for a test drive. Yeah! Dean has a great time. He ends up yeah. giving him extra credit and letting him keep the car the entire time he's at military boarding yeah, school. Yeah, cool. So his grades oh. were a little lackluster his freshman year because he was busy restoring a car. After that, he aced absolutely everything from sophomore to senior year. He goes on to apply to go to MIT to become a civil engineer. He gets rejected by MIT because huh. his grades were lacking his freshman year. So he drives his whippet that he rebuilt all the way to MIT and he camps outside the admissions office for days until they agree to meet him. He then goes in and proceeds to persuade the head of admissions to let him into MIT. So he gets into MIT, goes on to become an engineer. While he's at college, he joins the ROTC program, which is like the pre-officer training program that they uh -huh. have in those colleges. While he's there, he ends up... I've heard... So... And I'm actually really curious on both sides of this spectrum, if you will. The ROTC program side and the... I don't want to say, like, actual military, because that's not technically correct, right? Like the the grunt side of things right even then that doesn't sound right so because there's contention on the rotc program but i mean it's not like it's necessarily bad it's more like you have people that get upset that rotc get fast tracked and sometimes they don't meet the qualifications that they should have but then you get rotc that are very good at what they do clearly so and they go on to do great things i'm very curious on both sides of this aisle NCOs versus enlisted. Thank you, Kiwi. Very curious on both sides of this aisle. Thoughts on the ROTC program? Because I, I really don't have a say in this. I really don't have enough experience to really have an opinion, if that makes sense. I know talking with my Cow Scout buddy in one of our one of our numerous excursions where we just walk around and talk about existence <laughs> and the nature of the universe, right? Is that, I mean, officers should have a mix of coursework, right? Which ROTC can provide and actual hands-on work as well, like being an officer, you know, being the actual officer, right? So I'm very curious, actually, in the comments section, let me know uh, if you fall under the NCO or fall on the listed side of that uh, spectrum. I'm very curious on your input. Flying a plane and he absolutely loves it. It is now his new goal in life to become a fighter pilot. So naturally, yeah. he applies to go off to Army Air School to become a pilot, at which point he is pretty much immediately informed there's a 0% chance that he will ever get inside of a fighter plane because he's way too big. At this point in time, they only let the smaller yeah. guys be the fighter pilots, and all the bigger guys had to go work in bombers, and Jay was a big dude, well over six foot. So it's not exactly what he wanted, but it is the next best thing. No big deal. He goes in, does the paperwork, does the physical exam. Bad news, his eyes suck, and his vision is not good enough to become a pilot. So God, my eyes suck. I resemble this. <laughs> God. I am so... I'm blind even with my glasses. I regularly can't see stuff. Watch me play any game, like in any of the VODs or episodes I have, and I will miss things right in front of my face. <laughs> I relate to that. So the entire notion of being a pilot gets shelved for now, at least. He goes back to college, continues going through the ROTC program to be an Army infantry officer. And while this is going on, he's constantly researching on ways to make his eyes better. And he mm. finally comes across this crazy optometrist named Dr. Bates, and he has the Bates method. Basically, this method wanted to treat your eyes like they were muscles. Bates believed that glasses enabled your eyes to be lazy, so he would crush his patient's glasses and then force them to do a bunch of eye straining exercises in hopes of building up better vision, similar to how you would lift weights to get bigger muscles. I don't think that's how that works. I don't think that's how that works. Like, like for my very, very mediocre understanding of biology... I get where he's coming from, especially, especially in the 1900s. I get it. I understand where he's coming from. I think that would actually harm your eyes more than that would do, more than more than that would help it, because you're straining. I, I'd be very curious. I mean, I, I could be completely wrong. I'm very interested. One of these exercises included staring directly into the sun. Obviously. Okay. Yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> he had me until that was. Until that was mentioned. Uh, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> Old medical stuff is wild. Well, remember, lobotomies were, like, actually a thing up through, I think, the early 1990s. Like, we have made significant advancements in medicine in the past hundred years alone. Let's put it that way. 
<laughs> Fast three tours and got out when the war was over. Hell yeah. Well, at least he got out, right? With hindsight being 2020, this didn't work that well and no. it certainly wasn't recommended. But the young Jay Zimmer wanted to be a pilot so bad that he was, in fact, willing to go outside every day and attempt to beat the sun oh, in the staring contest. No. That hurts. Nope. Oh, I'm just thinking about it to make my eyes hurt. <laughs> Essentially trying to give himself a caveman version of LASIK. Obviously, yeah. this does not improve his eyesight. If anything, it makes, makes it, it better, worse. but it does highlight just how bad this guy wanted to be a pilot. So yeah. World War II kicks off, standards get lowered, and he gets accepted into the bombing program. And from there, he becomes the top of his class pretty much immediately. He is so good at flying bombers that he can actually perform fighter maneuvers inside of a bomber, which is something most pilots would never even imagine. But not only... So he really is just built different, even with... Even with his habit of staring into the sun, he can still just do some crazy shit. Not only is he naturally talented at it, he also works extremely hard. He could tell every single American, German, and Japanese plane and their capabilities just by their silhouette. Huh. End of all. Oh, 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 oh. No, you idiots. It's a pigeon. So Jay Zemer is hands down the best <laughs> bomber pilot in training right now. And somewhere along the lines during training, he becomes friends with the best bombardier in training by the name of Joe Sarnofsky. This guy is basically the Larry Bird at putting warheads on foreheads. They hit it off. They become best friends. They have a ton in common. After they graduate from school, they get separate missions and they uh -huh. get separated. So yeah. early 1942, Jay Zemer gets assigned to the Fifth Air Force and he's not happy about it because the Fifth Air Force is also referred to as the Forgotten Fifth. The reason they're called that is because they are stationed in Australia and their job right now is to basically run a containment war against Japan, trying yeah. to slow them down and contain them to the Pacific. Yeah, it's and at pretty this point out time, there. Nobody cares about the Pacific theater. The entire world is watching the European theater as America and Great Britain fight their way through North Africa into Italy to take back France and eventually overthrow Germany. That's where the majority of the funding's going. That's where all the attention and glory is. That's the place where young, motivated men like Jay Zemer want to be. Mm -hmm. But that didn't happen. So no. Jay shows up to Australia. He is is the FNG, the fucking new guy. <laughs> nobody trusts him. He has zero street cred. Nobody wants him in their crew. Now, this uh -huh. is partially due to the fact that he's a new guy, and that's just how it goes for new guys, sure. But mainly, it's because the Japanese are kind of kicking America's ass right now. It's mm -hmm. mid-1942. America just got involved in this war. A lot of their pilots are inexperienced. A lot of their equipment's outdated. And everybody's giving all the funding to the European theater. So... So, and that's the thing, is that, like, the Japanese military in World War II was really good i mean like you like, oh japan small island and you know what I, no like they had heart they had skill they had a lot not saying you know no another country did as well japan was a force to be reckoned with absolutely oh it's not a great time and you got to remember since this is 1942 america hasn't come out with the hellcat or the corsair yet meaning that america has no fighter plane capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the japanese mitsubishi zero so even mm. if the bombers did have a fighter escort they weren't capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the japanese zeros anyways so it has never been more dangerous to be inside of a bomber it has never been more important to have everybody in that bomber crew as good as possible to increase everybody's chances of survival if so facto nobody wants to risk it on giving a new guy a shot so it becomes yeah. Yeah. To Jay early on. <laughs> Raven, thank you for the resub. <laughs> FNGs, go get the ice mix. Oh my god. I just... Well, it's because I work in kitchens that I know of that. I mean, people go on blinker fluid, muffler bear. It's... Oh man, there's so many. I'm very curious what other hazing the military has. <laughs> <laughs> like go get some like bolt carrier grease i don't know but i feel like that would actually be like something relevant on that if he ever wants to get up in the air he's gonna have to do some gangster shit so he goes over to the bulletin board and on that bulletin board Damn are like the that. missions that are deemed so incredibly dangerous that they are volunteer bases only and he starts volunteering for all of them filling in any position where he's needed mm -hmm. the majority of these missions would wind up being reconnaissance missions which is where they're going to take a b-17 flying fortress instead of filling it with bombs they're going to fill it with extra fuel tanks equip it with cameras and send it way off into enemy held territory all by itself mm -hmm. to hopefully get some valuable intel. Now, as I'm sure you can imagine, a Oh my god, Hummer Keys. <laughs> <laughs> Japanese engineers and pilots grunts are good at what they do. Uh, they feel them because of the incompetence of their leadership. That sounds like that tracks. That sounds like that that tracks. And all ultimately it was also because of the, the spicy bombs is how I will word that for YouTube, how they were dropped, right? That also was crippling to morale, especially to leadership. 
Ooh, far my face in Germany. Uh, told stories that draftees didn't want to get sent to the Pacific Theater. The Pacific Theater was right earlier. An earlier comment said that it was effectively similar to World War One, except you know, in the Pacific, which I feel is a very good descriptor of water mix and ice filters. No. <laughs> Oh my god. Tran hiked with a bunch of bikes through the forest. Their tanks couldn't pass through to conquer fiercely thought on conquer. Yeah, no. There's Japan was a force to be reckoned with. And so to see the evolution from 42 through 45 is interesting. Single bomber flying alone in enemy held territory is extremely dangerous. Yeah. And nobody is about to let their pilot or co pilot be the brand new guy fresh out of school. So Jay just has to fill in wherever there's a gap. Over right. time, he winds up doing everything. He's a tail gunner, a ball gunner, a waste gunner, a navigation guy, a radio guy. He can do everything. So and he is the jack of all trades. He works himself up enough credit that they let him be co-pilot for a little while. And while he's working as a co-pilot, he figures out something very, very important. You have to remember, he's an engineer. He loves uh -huh. taking things apart, figuring out how they work, why they work, trying to make them better. Right. And while he's sitting in the co-pilot seat, he figures out how the Japanese Zeros are tackling the B-17s. You have to uh -huh. remember, this is 1942. The B-17s that they are flying are the B-17Bs. They are the first generation of mass-produced B-17s ever, and they have one fatal flaw, and the Japanese figured out how to exploit it. You see, the B-17s have a ton of machine guns all over them to defend themselves. They have a tail gunner, a ball gunner, a waste gunner on each side, yeah. and a turret on top. The problem is none of those can shoot in front of the plane. The only thing the front of the plane has is two 30 caliber flex guns, which you can kind of see right here, which might as well be nothing at all when it comes to shooting down an actual plane. Later How did this get past design? I mean, I guess to be fair, maybe like mass production, but like, no, he brings up a good point. No, like that's. Yeah, actually, no, that, that yeah. Bullets can hit propellers. I guess that's fair, too. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Okay, that makes a little more sense now. Uh, Navy's go-to is telling someone to go get a can of red, white, and blue spray paint. Oh, no. Later generations of the B-17 would end up getting more firepower and turrets on the front to help alleviate this issue. But at this point in time, they didn't have that. So the Japanese no. Zeros would approach from behind well out of range of the machine guns, pass the B-17 all and together, from the front. and then go yep. and do a U-turn and approach the B-17 head on and shoot it down, where the B-17 had no way to defend itself. Nope. And during his time as a co-pilot, Jay Zemer caught on to this and developed a plan. Fast forward, Jay Zemer on his first mission, he finally got enough street cred, and there was finally a mission dangerous enough that they were going to let him be the pilot. Sure uh -huh. enough, a Japanese Zero shows up, does the exact same thing, passes outside the range of the guns, does a big U-turn, comes back to confront Jay's B-17 head on. As soon as I mean, to be fair, that's like, that's such a really interesting way that Japanese tactics evolved to take on the B-17. Like, it's interesting when you consider the trial and error and research that went into getting that maneuver. Zero gets within range. Jay takes his B-17, turns it up on a wingtip, and banks, exposing the belly of the B-17 yeah. to Zero forcing the Zero to go the exact opposite direction and down, putting it directly in the firing lines of both the belly yep. gunner and the tail gunner, huh. shooting down the Zero. And that is just one of multiple combat maneuvers that Jay has engineered inside of his head, pushing the B-17 airframe to its absolute limit. Fast mm. forward into the mission, he lands the plane, no problem. The entire crew gets out and swears that they are never getting on a plane with Jay Zemer <laughs> flying it ever again. And that becomes a new norm for a couple months. Jay went from the new guy that nobody trusted to fly to now he's so good, he's crazy, and we're scared to fly with him. That was until a bunch of new... Re God, I love those people. The people that you have respect for, you're like, God, he's batshit insane. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> he's, he's an IRL game exploiter like most engineers. Yeah. Enforcements showed up on the island, and among them was none other than his best friend, Larry Bird. I mean, Joe Sarnofsky. So Jay what? and Joe start volunteering <laughs> to go on a bunch of dangerous missions together. Same thing happens every time they fly on a mission. Pretty much everybody else on the plane refuses to ever go on a mission with those two ever again because they're absolutely crazy. But every once in a while, they find somebody just crazy enough to keep flying with them. And over the course of a couple months, they build up an entire air crew that starts volunteering together on every dangerous mission available, <laughs> earning them the nickname name the eager beavers yeah Making up the team we have bud thule apparently the only man smart enough to be a navigator and crazy enough to fly with these guys and then of course we have jay zemer as the pilot yeah. joe sarnowski is the bombardier and from there it just gets completely out of hand because after that we have the radio expert william bond aka 
Willie. He is one of the most <laughs> experienced bomber crew members in the entire US military at this point that's been on countless missions, one of which his B-17 landed to refuel when his crew was ambushed by 500 Japanese soldiers. Wow. They took the machine guns out of their B-17 and proceeded wow. to defend themselves in a firefight for 10 hours until the Australians showed back up. And during wow. that 10 hours, Willie had 14 confirmed kills, four of which were in close quarters combat, two with his Colt 45 1911, and two with his knife. Jay Zemer. This dude's just a Resident Evil protagonist. Like, like Leon S. Kennedy, like Jack Krauser. <laughs> it just. <laughs> well, <laughs> pistol ain't working right now. <laughs> Didn't I tell you rookie dives are quicker? My Jack Krauser voice is awful. Don't. <laughs> you get what I mean? Just... <laughs> next, next, he's just going to be punching boulders, isn't he? <laughs> he said he didn't Legend. plan on getting in any knife fights at 30,000 feet, but if he did, he had Willie. Next, we have camera expert and waste gunner George Kendrick. Typically on a B-17, you're supposed to have one waste gunner on either side of the plane, but Kendrick preferred to man both sides completely by himself. When How? Jay Zemer asked him if he wanted to find another waste gunner for the other side, Kendrick said, and I quote, these are my guns and I'm going to shoot all of them. I don't need to be bumping asses with another guy while I do it, which is. It reminds me of a buddy I had. <laughs> he was in the military. He slept with the 50 cal on top of the, the vehicle. That was his 50 cal. Ain't no one was touching her. <laughs> Same energy. <laughs> The most American shit I've ever heard yeah. in my entire life. <laughs> Next, we have Johnny Abel, a 19-year-old farm kid that's so mechanically gifted that he is deemed more valuable as a mechanic on the ground than he is a member of a bombing crew. Despite huh. that, he wants to be a pilot. So, Jay is teaching him how to become a pilot, but in the meantime, he's the topside turret gunner. Next, we have the tail gunner, and he is the biggest, fastest, strongest man in the entire 5th Air Force, Herbert Pugh, a.k.a. Pudge. There was a couple other stragglers yeah. that came and went, went on a couple missions here, a couple missions there, but this was it. This was a core group of men that became best friends and went on the most dangerous bombing runs and reconnaissance missions that the war had to offer. Because of this, they very quickly built up an incredible reputation and became too valuable to lose, at which point leadership doesn't let them go out on the dangerous missions anymore, and they send them out on a regular bombing run with like 10 other B-17s. You know, so I think that's the duality, right? Where it's kind of like in the modern workforce, right? We're Working in modernity, right? The worst thing you can be is efficient and good at your job, right? At least this is what people will argue. Obviously, take that with a grain of salt, do your own research, etc. You know, make your own, draw your own conclusions. And this is at least what I have found, right? Because you can be the person that can do half of your so if you're working in say a team, right, or a group, you can do the equivalent of half, if not more, of your entire team's work by yourself in half the time. But Suddenly, you're having to pick up the other team's slack, right? You're having to stay over. You're having to get passed up for promotions, right? And so, I guess that's the military equivalent, right? Where if you're just this good, if you're gaining this much notoriety, suddenly you're too valuable an asset to lose. And so, thus, you're stuck on these safer runs. I'm assuming this would be the military equivalent, though. Which, like... That almost serves as a punishment, right? Kind of like, you know, you having to pick up the rest of the team's quote-unquote slack, you having to stay over, getting passed up is a punishment, so to speak. Like, I would assume that would be just gut-wrenching in the military. Like, especially if you're good at something. Like, say you're a really good Humvee gunner. Say you're really good at um, reconnaissance, right? Or maybe you're a damn good sniper. Like, you can take uh, <laughs> take the hat of an elite off at 2,000 yards, right? That kind of thing, right? And suddenly you're on effectively baby duty. Not, not to say that military is. You get what I'm trying. You, you get what I'm trying to. You get what I'm trying to say here. I'm trying to like explain myself less. You know what I'm trying to say here. Like, that'd be demoralizing and would almost feel like a punishment, right? And if that wasn't bad enough, they're gonna make Jay and his men 
be the first bomber in line, which if you don't know, is the safest bomber in the entire run, because as soon as their bombs hit the ground, that's what alerts the enemy that they're even there. So when mm. they go through, there's no enemies manning the anti-aircraft guns, so they're done and gone by the time there's any enemies returning fire. It's that second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth plane that mm -hmm. faces the real danger, and that's just not okay with Jay and his men. So no. they go out on the mission just like they're ordered to, and they are the first ones to drop their bombs just like they're ordered to. They make a clean getaway, they get out to open ocean, at which point Jay tells his men, get ready for a fight because he does a U-turn, goes back in, <laughs> flies over the enemy compound at a thousand feet while his men from the ball turret, the waste guns, and the tail guns open fire on the enemy's anti-aircraft positions on the ground literally how much trouble do you get it for doing that because you can't do that not normally right i mean i mean you see it in games like resident evil right where you know well the mission is this but i'm gonna do it my own or even call of duty right you see it in a lot of movies a lot of video games right where you know uh orders are this we're gonna do it puts on glasses light cigar my way right i'm hearing in chat that'd be a, that'd be a court martial right like you, that is as much as we like hearing people in in pop culture media etc doing that right you know chief mind telling me what you're doing with that right exactly like you even see master chief, master chief actually does it a lot the fact that i'm pretty sure he's been court martialed in the expanded like expanded content right but like master chief as far as i'm aware is like he's a damn good spartan i don't think he's necessarily a good soldier that follows orders i'd have to have somebody compare master chief and his antics to actual service uh service members and how that works i'd, I'd be very interested to uh, hear a description of that but like yeah you can't like do that best case reprimand demotion potential reassignment worst case court martial yeah so this is a very very big serious deal like oh my god yeah who's gonna stop master chief now you're right <laughs> see that is fair too uh dad was passed over promotion to a sergeant because uh his gunny just got some reason absolutely despised him yeah i hear that i hear things like that work uh work against them as well in regards to public perception and or the right people not saying that they should go up yeah follow orders to get things done yeah literally becoming a ground attack plane like they're an antique c-130 they were able to knock out all of the enemy spotlights and most of their anti-aircraft positions and every single b-17 on that mission made it back home so jay the eager beavers and all the other b-17s on this mission make it back to base completely okay at which point Jay is treated like a hero by his commanding officers. No, I'm right. just kidding. You see, the commanding officers no. can't give themselves a bunch of medals if their men are defying orders but doing the right thing because Fuck. it makes them look bad. So naturally, Jay is somehow the bad guy here. So he and the eager beavers are all confined to quarters pending court martial. The only these are the people that are upset are E5 and above, right? From what I understand. Like, oh my god, Chief doesn't follow orders because he doesn't respect anybody in the chain of command. They don't know the thing he knows. They haven't seen things he's seen. Last official officer truly respected was Johnson. I, I could see that, though. And I know that in regards to uh, UNSC not really going after Chief, wasn't there that whole campaign to bond a bunch of terrorists shooting up a meeting the Arbiter was going to be at and then Oni blaming part of it on Chief, I think? There was a whole thing about that. I think it was in a book or comic. Uh, Monica respect Lasky. Yeah, he, he has respect for Lasky. He does. But yeah, no, it's like on one hand, you want to follow orders. On the second hand, like, because I understand what if you're overestimating your abilities, right? Like if I was in military service, I'm not. If I, oh, they're command, commissioned officer. Okay, so there's a difference. Okay. So if I was in the military and I'm like, oh, well, I'm going to, I can go take out that entire uh, fob that the uh, opposition has, right? And I just become Swiss cheese. Okay, clearly I'm defying orders and I'm thinking I'm hot shit when I'm clearly not, right? In this case where they think they're hot shit, they know they're hot shit and they are hot shit because they just did that, that, that's a little different. That's a hard one. I, as a civilian, really don't have a leg in this race and really breaking this down. The reason that Jay and his entire crew weren't kicked out of the military right then and there was because there was a journalist in Australia with the 5th Air Force that heard the story from one of the other B-17 crews and they reported on it, writing a story that would end up getting read by a congressman that wanted it investigated <laughs> and he demanded and ordered that chain of command to give Jay joe and all of his men on that air crew a silver star so at that point jay and all of his men get a silver star leadership just kind of has to drop the issue but yeah. also 
fuck these guys. We're not going to give them easy missions anymore. We're only going to give them the hardest missions we have. And if they die, they die. We don't really care anymore because they wow. made us look bad. Which is exactly what Jay and his men wanted all along. So it all works out. All right, fast forward. <laughs> next big. Well, fine. You know what? We're not giving you any of these <laughs> any of these missions anymore. You're getting the hard shit now, everybody. Thank fucking God. <laughs> it's just the shit. And that's that's what a lot of like, I, I, I there's like a lot of like modern management and uh, work I've done that has I have had to deal with that where I'm like I want I want to do these things and they're like well we can't have you do that and finally there's like well fine we're not giving you the easy shit anymore you're doing this and I'm like thank fuck I've been doing this this whole time <laughs> jokes on you I'm into that shit dangerous mission officially known as flight of the geishas naval code breakers have deciphered enough messages to figure out that in the city of Rabul there's a hotel and the penthouse of that hotel is being used as an exclusive officers club Ooh. where they are being entertained by a bunch of geishas and getting hammered and among those hammer this is actually very important defying orders risk too many lives if you fail since commission officers are big picture thinking that that thank you for that explanation officers is rumored to be none other than admiral yamamoto the leader of the entire japanese oh, Navy. No. their mission is to fly in with a single b-17 under the cover of night bomb that hotel take out all the high-ranking officers and make a clean getaway so jay wouldn't that be a war crime Especially if civilians were hit. Like, and that's the way. Like, oh, like, Kip Hindsight's 20. Yeah, yeah, it is. Like, what else do you do in that situation? Do you have, like, some deep cover CIA infil infiltrate the area with a suppressed, like, a pistol? Like, like, what do you do? The most efficient way that, the, the, sure, this is done and dusted. Yeah, like, bomb it we even chats confirming yeah that is a war crime winners never yeah i'm not i really can't speak to winners not getting charged <laughs> i have to remain apolitical on that if you're winning their suggestions <laughs> yeah see that's how you play the game <laughs> now it is i don't know i'd have to check Geneva world war ii era Cir circle world war ii yeah firebombing at tokyo as well that's yeah, but and that's the thing is like, well, what else would you do? There's like, what what else do you do? I mean, you're going to go with your action trope, one man, John Wick against the entire hotel, right? And they're going to instantly know friend from foe. But real life is a lot messier than that. And this really, considering the era and just the Pacific theater in general, seemed like it was the best course of action that was that presented itself whether it's right or wrong i mean i will let people far more qualified to speak on that just i don't know, just kind of bring up that i'm pretty sure you can't just do that to civilians and the crew get pulled in they get briefed on the mission no big deal everybody's going to go off to bed they got a big day tomorrow everybody except for joe sarnofsky he stays mm -hmm. up all night long studying Style military the targets okay the city of rabul nobody knows why they just think he's over cautious they go to bed. Joe stays. He's up. on to Fast something. The next day, they take off on their mission. Jay flies them all the way there, gets them real close to the hotel. At which point, Jay can actually send the controls of the plane over to Joe Sarnofsky in the bomb bay, so Joe can control the plane and really line up the shot that he wants mm -hmm. with this bomb. So Jay sends the controls over to Joe. Joe opens the bomb doors and veers way off course, miles and miles off course, mm -hmm. like 10 miles off course, Joe steers this plane, essentially blind, driving the plane just from what he can see outside of the bomb bay. Mm -hmm. And then before anybody even knows what's happening, Joe just says bombs away, drops the bombs on a seemingly random location and sends the controls back over to Jay. Everyone is completely confused. Yeah. Nobody knows what's going on. The bombs make impact and there is a humongous explosion, way bigger than this five. Did he take out the power station? He had to have taken out the power station, right? War crime here because the target was uh, too intriguing to ignore. Can be looked over? I know the Japanese military was known for nobody would care because the allies. Yeah, I guess that's fair. 500 pound bomb could have ever done on its own. Joe had just hit a major ammunition depot for the oh. entire Japanese Navy, and his single bomb set off a chain reaction, blowing up the entire facility. Come to find out, Joe Sarnowski didn't feel right about killing innocent geisha girls and he decided that he was going to find a target that was just as if not more valuable than the officers club and blow that up instead so they huh. make it back to base tell leadership that's 
So that's an interesting conversation that I've tried to like delve into, but I have not really been able to figure out. So if you are given an order that in this case where we can say this is by definition a war crime, at least by modern Geneva Geneva suggestions, right? And you actively defy an order like that because civilians might be involved. What are the repercussions for that? Because you can, you're getting in trouble, right, for de- de- defying orders, right? I don't like. This is a hard one. Like, this is one of those gray area questions that I love, but it that is one of those that like. God, there's so many things to consider in that. Would be a hotel failing that would have been a weapons manufacturing, right? Okay, yeah, and that is the next best target. And if anything, it not only helps out the initial goal, right? It it also, to other places in the Pacific Theater, it starves the Japanese military of ammo from that depot now. Like, like you're not, like, that is not lost on me. That's perfectly reasonable. I need to see how this plays out because that is defying a direct order, but you are hitting the next best thing and the original order would have potentially involved civilians. Just as public to play of discipline, but privately no action would be taken. Hmm. Given a lawful order and defying it is a bad idea, but we are taught what constitutes a lawful order. Okay. Perfectly valid target, perhaps not the most ideal considering the opportunity cost of changing the target. Yeah. I'm curious how this is going to go. I'm curious how this is going to go over. Everything that happened and leadership is absolutely furious yes. that they decided to do their own thing instead. They interrogate the entire crew, but right. nobody is ratting on Joe Sarnowski. Yeah, something did. I didn't know what that meant. Some more <laughs> so as a punishment, they're ordered to do the mission again and this time do it right. But that is essentially a death sentence because now they, they know, know that the Americans are bombing the city right. and they're going to be on high alert. So they're just going to do it anyways. And I think leadership was actually trying to get them killed, but it's not Probably. really going to work out that Allegedly. way. So crew goes to bed early. Joe Sarnowski stays up all night again, studying the map of the city of Rabul. And yet again, the same exact thing happens. Jay gets them all the way there, completely undetected, sends the controls of the plane over to Joe. Joe opens the bomb bay, veers way off course, miles and miles off course, bombs a seemingly random location, and there is an even bigger explosion than the day before. It is an enormous explosion. Jay had just taken out a major fuel depot again for the entire Japanese Navy. They make their way back to base, at which point... Well, so here's the thing, right? Is that what... I think intelligence would play a factor into it. I think, reasonably, if they know someone's in the area, maybe they're going to go hide this general, right? Maybe they're going to go hide high-ranking officers, or at least they're going to be on high alert, and they might not all be centralized in this building. But then again, humans aren't necessarily rational creatures, and they could just say, fuck it, we're going to go get (laughs) hammered and party with the geishas. Entirely possible. If no talks, no gets in trouble. Like, isn't that the same as they can't court martial us all, but they can? <laughs> they are effectively grounded, and leadership will never give them a B-17 to fly again because they refuse to follow orders. And oh, they no. are given absolutely no credit for single-handedly bombing major fuel and ammunition depots in the city of Rabul. All right, so leadership's being a bunch of dicks. They're not going to let... Yeah, the, Jap- the, the Japanese leadership wouldn't be in that hotel anymore. So that contextually makes sense. I mean, what intel are you going to have to go on that they're still going to be in the same hotel, right? Like, I mean, maybe that's just pop culture, like, distorting the lens when I look at this through, right? But if you know that a target is going to be an X location, and there is a failure to... And say maybe you get rid of target Y, right, in location Z, right? And it's known that this target Y was taken out, right? Do you think that the original target X is necessarily going to stay in the same place. Do you think that they're not going to go retreat somewhere? Not necessarily to some secret underground bunker, right? But that they might be a little more cautious in where they're at and knowing that there's a threat in the area, right? As far as me looking at through that, right? I just... That's interesting. But Jay and the eager beavers fly any more of the good B-17s, which sucks because at that point, there's really nothing that they can do unless they plan on building their own airplane. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and at that point, if there were only civilians in there, then that would be a just a, a, a true all out, like no doubt about it, war crime. Like, yeah, <laughs> like there's no defense in that point. Which 
which is exactly what they do. So Jay and the Beavers go out to the boneyard, and the boneyard I guess that's is fair, not Raven, just where planes go the to hotel die. Wouldn't they be go changed there to be cannibalized because it wasn't target. Yeah, they may have left to keep all the other planes still running. And what they come across is what used to be a B-17. It has oh, been no. stripped of every usable part and is covered in bullet holes. And there is no way that this thing is gonna fly. The only pops out, the breaks out the keg, <laughs> pops open a cold one. I could fix it. <laughs> only identifying characteristics of this plane at all was the faded word Lucy up on the front and the tail number 2666, which would later bring about its nickname, <laughs> Old 666. So now they have a plane, they just need to fix it, a seemingly impossible task, but they have Jay Zemer, the engineer, and Johnny Abel, the 19-year-old mechanical prodigy, that set forward restoring this plane, while wow. everybody else on the crew goes out and steals all the parts they need to do it. I mean, strategically transfers <laughs> equipment to an alternate location. So some yes. of the equipment that the eager beavers managed to acquire Fire. included four new cyclone engines, radio equipment, camera equipment, and 19 50 caliber machine guns. Right. It's just impressive at that point. Just tactically acquiring this, it's just that's impressive. Like that is God, like I part of me is curious. I'm kind of like, okay, but but who has this beat? And I'm also like, I don't think I can legally ask that question. And I don't want to open up that line of questioning because it'll suddenly become a dick waving contest of who has strategically acquired and transferred things to an alternative location. Uh, it, it'll, just, it'll just be threads of it. And I guarantee you I'm already on a DOD watch list because I do military content. <laughs> I just... I just... Like, I'm curious, but I'm also like, I'm not that curious as to risk a suited, a suited person coming to my door saying, Kip, I need to have a talk. You can't exactly start conversations by saying, ah, yes, what have you strategically acquired? Who has, who has more strategically <laughs> acquired? Who's got the biggest record? <laughs> 110 pounds a piece for those M2s. Jesus. Right off the bat, we have a problem because right around the time that the beavers start finding all of this amazing equipment, a bunch Stuff of other going air crews seemingly have lost <laughs> a bunch of their amazing equipment. So a bunch of them are going to go back and try to steal it off of old 666, Aww. at which point the only logical solution is for the entire crew to start living on old 666 while they restore it all day and all night and spread the... Please tell me there's a movie about this. Because this, this is ripe for like like a team level campy movie word that the 50 caliber machine guns are loaded and if that doesn't work you get to fight willy about it at this point leadership is you know that is a good question lord of eternity how do you steal an engine but then i realized that i maybe shouldn't have access to this information <laughs> maybe i should not know how to strategically acquire an engine and transport it to an alternative location <laughs> has completely lost control of the situation. Everybody's calling Jay Zemer and the Eager Beavers pirates, renegades. Everybody's looking at leadership to stop them, at which point leadership is kind of like, fuck, I think they might be talking to me too, and I don't want to fight <laughs> Willie, so we're all just going to look the other way. Like we talked about earlier in the video, there's not much firepower at the front of a B-17, so they take a 50 caliber machine gun, mount it right on the nose cone, and they yeah. line it up with the rivet line going Don't worry down about the it, exactly. of the cab, and they rig it up so that there's a button inside the cockpit for Jay Zemer to hit to be able to fire the 50 caliber machine gun. So all he has to do is aim the rivet line at the enemy and fire. He calls it his schnozzler gun. Then the other two <laughs> yeah. 30 caliber guns on the front of the B-17 are replaced with 50 cals. The navigator compartment usually had one 30 caliber machine gun. Now it's gonna have dual 50s. Then the seat for the radio guy who typically never even had a gun. Oh, well, we're gonna cut a hole in the plane and give him two 50 caliber machine guns as well. You know, so we went over this in the mosquito video, right? About how people, laughed off the idea of a wooden plane in World War II, right? I mean, this is what well, maybe this was the no, that th this was after that, right? Maybe. Yeah, because the Pacific Theater lasted longer than the European Theater, right? By several months. No, I mean, this is about the same time period. I was trying to say maybe this is the benchmark they were using for kitted to the teeth flying iron fortress. Well, flying steel fortress. But I don't think that's necessarily the case this is also technically done off the record so to speak well then we get to george kendrick's area the waste guns typically there's 150 caliber on each side 
double it. Now we're getting dual 50s on each side yeah. because that's not enough. We're also going to cut another hole in the bottom of the plane and give him dual 50s there as well. That way, when Jay banks up in front of the zero, not only can the ball turret gunner hit the zero, Kendrick is also going to be able to hit the zero as well. Then huh. in case any of the guns malfunction, they have three extra 50 caliber machine guns strapped down on the inside of the plane. Old 666 now has more than double the firepower of any other B-17 in the Pacific Theater. And after shedding over 2,000 pounds, it is also the fastest but all that firepower isn't going to be that's insane that's actually insane they shedded weight to do this too what the hell <laughs> Jeez. you're worth a whole lot if they don't know how to use it so jay uh -uh. and johnny continue working on the plane while everybody else is sent out to go train and become experts on the m250 caliber machine gun the beavers get to the point where every single member of the crew can assemble and disassemble the m2 browning in under a minute while blindfolded joe That's and jay hot, also actually. make it a rule that every gunner inside of their aircraft has to link their own ammunition belts and they're going to change up how they do ammunition you see at this point a b17 50 caliber machine gun had an ammo link that went armor piercing round armor piercing round incendiary round incendiary round right. tracer if you don't know a tracer is like the little one that looks like a laser beam coming out from star wars they yeah. do that so that you can tell where your fire is going and so that your friends can how is how, wow <laughs> i don't think i've never actually seen tracers in use okay see where your fire is going they start linking their ammunition so it's armor piercing round tracer round and they do this for psychological warfare because when you're yeah. shooting every other round is a tracer round out of a machine Machine gun it looks it like you're firing more look like old 666 is something out of star wars straight up shooting laser beams at the enemy that's actually really cool though like that actually makes a lot of sense well and so what i was trying to get well so if it was ap ap incendiary incendiary tracer right so every five rounds is the tracer it could give the illusion of a faster volume of fire every i love everything about that actually I, there's everything about that is perfect. Yeah, So they actually. finish up the plane and they start volunteering for every single dangerous mission that they can find. They volunteer for so many missions so often that they never actually got an opportunity to finish the nose art on the plane like you see all the other bombers have in the movies and in the old pictures. And that's why the plane never got a cooler nickname other than its tail number, Old 666. Now, every other round at 750 like RPM, yes. Recon, it is Jay, the Eager Beavers, and Old 666 going up into enemy territory completely by themselves. And every single time they come into enemy zeros they light them up huh. the new machine guns are incredible and old 666 is the aerial equivalent of george foreman on his second title run he's big <laughs> he's fat he's got terrible gas mileage but if you're gonna stand in the pocket and trade with them you're probably gonna get put in the ground allegedly with the combination of increased speed increased firepower jay's piloting tactics and the entire crew's newfound machine gun proficiency they were shooting down so many enemies that it became unbelievable so yeah. the crew came back and people started doubting them. So they're like, fine, we're just going to rig up the cameras to turn on every time we start firing the machine guns. That way, we film us shooting down the enemy fighters, which yeah. is the most world star shit I've ever heard in my entire life. They were literally kicking so much ass that to get people to believe them, they had to <laughs> prematurely invent the GoPro 70 years ahead of time. The beating picture didn't happen, bet. <laughs> continue for a little while old 666 the eager beavers and jay zemer build up this enormous reputation and eventually leadership would approach jay with the most dangerous mission he'd ever heard of all right so here's a mission the marines are going to make a 40,000 man amphibious landing in bougainville but okay. before they do that they wanted to get aerial footage over the coastline because they wanted to find out where all the reefs were so the marine corps didn't get caught up on the reefs with their amphibious landing vehicles mm -hmm. the problem with that is the only way to get enough high definition in that footage to be able to see reefs that are underwater is to use a trimetragon camera setup, which is three cameras where they merge all the footage together. And the hmm. only way to actually film this and make it work is to fly in a perfectly straight line under perfect weather conditions Fuck. and they can't move the plane at all. Even a single degree of tilt would ruin the entire thing. And in order to film this coastline, they're gonna have to do that for 22 minutes straight in enemy territory and that enemy territory may or may not have enemy fighters and anti-aircraft guns on the coast and if the like when you're presented with that like 
I mean, we see it all the time in pop culture, movies, games, an impossible task for the agent or the soldier or the unit or company, right? God, that is a tall fucking order. I, I, I got, I got, I'm, I'm, I'm on the edge of my seat. If there is anti-aircraft guns on the coast, it's pretty much game over because again, they have to fly in a perfectly straight line for 22 minutes straight in broad fucking daylight. Yeah. The worst gunner on the planet <laughs> has enough time to get dialed in and shoot them down. And yeah. that's assuming they even make it to the coastline because Bougainville is 600 miles into enemy held territory. Because of this, the leadership only approached Jay with this mission because they were just hoping that he would pilot it. They never in their wildest dreams imagined that his entire crew would volunteer to go on this mission because it had such a low chance of survival. Despite right. that, after being briefed on the entire thing, Jay rushes over to the barracks where the beavers are, briefs them on the entire thing, and he's like, look, I'm calculating there's like a 10% chance that we survive this. I don't expect any of you to go with me. I don't blame you if you don't in any way, but... If you do want to volunteer, there's nobody I would rather have up there with me than you guys. At which point, every single one of the eager beavers stands up and they're going with it. Yeah. Fuck yeah, they're this in. Guy we're gonna Later on, <laughs> when retelling this story, one of the beavers is quoted as saying, We thought so much of Captain Zemer and his abilities that we didn't give a damn where we went just so long as he wanted to go there. Yeah. Anything okay by him was okay by us. Jay then runs back over to the colonel. That's true leadership. A true leader inspires. I mean, I leader demands right a true leader can inspire that had just briefed him as he is pinning the volunteer slip onto the board to collect volunteers for this mission jay grabs the paper crumples it up says that him and the eager beavers are going to take the mission on one condition he does it how he wants to do it and they have no further input he will get the mission done uh -huh. at which point the colonel agrees and it's settled the only thing to do now is to get prepared for the mission and wait for army meteorologists to tell them that they're going to have a day clear enough to actually pull this off it's mm -hmm. monsoon season a couple of weeks go by and then finally they get word from the army weather guys hey tomorrow's the day the weather's going to break you can get this mission done so from chat you, you you get presented a mission like that seems to be one of two reasons the chain of command is that impressed with your prowess and ability and confidence two you've pissed off the chain of command so thoroughly they want you gone any way they legally can oh my god that sounds about right they all get prepped and they take off first thing in the morning when it's still dark out for this dangerous mission so they take off they're making their way over to bougainville they get like halfway there it's still dark out everything's going great and leadership radios over to jay and they're like hey by the way um extra credit it would be pretty cool if you could pop up to the top of the island and film buka passage as well we don't need trimetragon footage just normal footage would work. you can do it while it's still kind of dusk out if you could get that done too that'd be great at which point jay yeah. is like N no I don't I don't need extra credit during this extremely dangerous mission. That wasn't what we agreed to. I'm not doing that. Then they're like, well, <laughs> too bad. It's an order to which he just like hangs up. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> too bad. Wasn't asking. This is not mandatory. Yeah, so it could be as chat saying option three or or both of those reasons. They're both impressed and they want you gone. <laughs> on the guy, he doesn't really care. He's going to do what he wants anyways, because that's been his MO the entire time. Yeah. Okay, fast forward. They get all the way to Bougainville. It's still too dark out for them to start filming with this trimetragon footage. So Jay asks the crew and he's like, look, uh, I can do a U-turn. We can fly 15 minutes out over the open ocean, do another U-turn, come back. That'll be half an hour. That should be bright enough by then. Or we could fly like 45 minutes north, film Buka Passage, and then come back and do this after. And the crew is like, I don't, whatever, I don't but care. Whatever. So they go, the they ride. film Buka Passage, then they come back. It is now broad daylight, so they start filming their trimetragon footage. They get five minutes into the 22-minute uh, run, and they come up on a Japanese airstrip. And on that airstrip is over 20 Japanese zeros, and he can see men running out to the planes yep. to come get them. Now, J so, I mean, at that point, what do you do? Could you break off the footage at that point? Because if you're going to... One degree of tilt can ruin the entire thing, right? Would you, at that point, assess the risk, break off, take out that airbase, then proceed to get the footage? That seems like that would be the play here. Because either way, if the constant is that your footage gets disrupted, at least you're neutralizing the threat for a period of time. And even then, your footage is still going to be... Oh, no bombs. They do have 50 cals, though. 
I don't know. That's a good one. A doesn't realize it at this point, but these weren't just normal Japanese Zeros. This was one of the best fighter squadrons that Fuck. Japan had that was specifically brought in to go take out Admiral Halsey. And in this squadron, they had two aces with a combined over 30 confirmed air-to-air -air kills. And even if this wasn't Fuck. a specialized badass fighter squadron, 20 on one is still completely undoable. Right. They'd gone up against five, six, seven Zeros. They'd never gone up against 10, let alone 20 plus. It's at this moment that Jay has to make a decision because he knows that by the time all the Japanese Zeros get up in the sky, get in their formation and actually attack him, he's going to have just enough time to finish this camera run. However, yeah. then he's going to have to fight his way out, which is yeah. probably a death sentence. Or he could cut and run right now, and he's almost guaranteed to be able to get away with a 20 minute head start. Uh -huh. He's taken a second to weigh his options and really think about it, and he's just about ready to cut and run, and he looks down at the water and he can just see all these reefs just right below the water, and he just envisions 40,000 Marines and their amphibious landing vehicles hung up on these reefs, getting cut down by enemy yeah. defenses and machine that is a valid thing like he he's aware of the weight of his of what he's having to do gunfire and he decides that he's gonna risk it to try to save these guys and for yeah. the next 17 minutes the crew gets ready for a fight as jay keeps the plane completely straight and level in broad daylight as yeah. all the zeros get up in the air to come get them. Fast forward 17 minutes later, two dozen Japanese Zeros have caught up to them and they are trailing just behind 666 out of machine gun range. Right uh -huh. as George Kendrick comes over the radio and says, give me 30 more seconds, three Zeros pass along the outside, do their U-turn to begin their attack run against 666. Oh no, they don't know. They don't know. They're not aware. Six. Then George Kendrick radios again that he has the film done. At this point, it's too late for Jade to do his normal evasive maneuver where he plays chicken with one of the zeros. So he just lines up the nose of the plane and his schnozzler gun with the lead zero shooting it down. Joe Sarnofsky down below inside the nose cone manning those guns manages to shoot down one of the other zeros. And the third and final zero was able to riddle the cockpit with 20 millimeter cannon fire. This fatally wounds both Jay Zemer and Joe Sarnofsky, takes out all the navigation navigation equipment for the plane, as well as the entire oxygen system. Jay Zemer is now slowly bleeding out inside of this cockpit with yeah. no way of knowing where he has this plane headed other than instinct and a compass that he's holding in his hand. And he has about 30 seconds of oxygen left before the entire crew passes out from hypoxia. Fuck. And the remaining Japanese zeros all now know that this is not a normal B-17. Their typical tactics aren't going to work and no. they just begin swarming every direction they can, firing from all angles. Jay immediately puts the plane into a nosedive, desperately trying to get below 10,000 feet so him and his men can breathe can survive. the oxygen yeah. system down. He drops 15,000 feet in just under 30 seconds. That is Ooh, ooh, atmospheric pressure. Ooh, atmospheric pressure changes are going to be rough. Over three miles in 30 seconds, this plane drops before Jay pulls it back up. And he estimates that they're at 8,000 feet. He doesn't actually know because the altimeter is broken. Yeah. And the only way he can tell the altitude that they're at is because he's such a good pilot, he can look at the pressure gauge for the engine manifolds and be able to tell. At this point, the entire situation devolves into an all out chaotic dogfight. Jay, while still bleeding out, is pulling off combat maneuvers inside of a B-17 that most pilots would never even attempt. And his crew instinctively mm -hmm. knows how he pilots that they're able able to pick off these Japanese zeros one by one. You're and that is the benefit of knowing who you're working with, knowing your coworker, knowing your teammate, knowing your platoon member, right? Because you just instinctively know dogfight at this point in time lasted for less than a minute and this dogfight would drag out for over 45 minutes and the Fuck. entire time Jay Zemer is losing more and more blood and more and more control of the plane because at some point both rudders would become damaged and he mm -hmm. would no longer be able to actually turn the plane using the rudders but he's such an incredible pilot that he begins individually throttling all four motors throttling one side up and the other side down, turning the plane that way. Throughout the course of this firefight, the eager beavers shoot down and completely destroy five Japanese Zeros, critically damage and send back a bunch of other ones. And by the end of this firefight, there's five or six left, fully functional <laughs> and coming to get them. And they are- They're pissed. Like they are pissed at that point. A couple, like a, a couple dozen, right? They are pissed at this point. Cause they, this is not a standard B-17. They they knew that from the from the opening gambit from the three coming towards them from the front. They are <laughs> almost out of ammunition and right as it looks like this is going to be the end 
the zeros peel off and do a U-turn as they have to go back because they've ran out of fuel. At yeah. this point, Jay Zemer passes out and the co-pilot is finally allowed to take over the aircraft, something that Jay Zemer refused to let him do in the heat of the fight. For the entire flight back, Jay is coming in and out of consciousness, and the last thing he remembers is them landing and the ground crew rushing in as he hears the medics say, get the pilot last, he's already dead. He would wake Fuck. up in the hospital days later to find out that he had lost over half the blood in his entire body, but the intel that they had gathered was going to be used to launch Operation Cartwheel, a highly successful Allied offensive that military planners credited that success to the intel that Jay Zemer and the Eager Beavers had gathered. Because of They were the only people that could have done this, I would argue. They were the only team that could have got this done. And that's not to discredit that there's a lot of successful and highly decorated pilots. They, at this time, they were probably the only team that could have done this. And they saved so many lives because they did this. Like, in, in incalculable amount of lives. This was huge. This, both Jay Zemer and Joe Sarnowski were to receive the Medal of Honor. Unfortunately, Joe would have to receive his posthumously. According yeah. to the accounts of the rest of the crew, he was struck by a 20 millimeter round during the first engagement. Despite that, he still managed to man the machine guns at the front of the B-17, shooting down an additional two Japanese Zeros before succumbing to his wounds. As for the rest of the Eager Beavers, four of them sustained injuries, but they all survived, and all of them were awarded the Distinguished Service Cross for this mission, making this the most decorated air crew in U.S. military history, and making this the most decorated mission in U.S. history. According to the official Japanese reports, this story is highly exaggerated because <laughs> according to them, they only sent up seven Zeros to intercept old 666 and none of them were shot down however when you take into account the verifiable fact that old 666 was hit with five 20 millimeter cannon rounds and sustained over 187 bullet holes and the crew depleted all of their ammunition literally thousands of pounds of 50 caliber rounds it kind of sounds like the japanese official reports are fucking lying so that they don't look <laughs> bad i mean i wasn't gonna say it Sound like this allegedly seems like a, a little bit of cover up. Allegedly, not that I can verify anything. Illusion. Now you know the story of Jay Zemer and the Eager Beavers, a bunch of young men that blurred the lines between bravery and insanity yeah. that ultimately were deemed so reckless that the government wouldn't give them a B 17 to fly. So they Actually built molding. their own and became the most decorated air crew in American history. Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over at thefatelectrician.com. Whack bang out. No, that was. Yeah, that's... that was a long video this time around. Uh, yeah. When you're editing this one in post-op, just cut out all the parts where I got teary-eyed. Those yeah. weren't emotions. My office is infested with onion-cutting ninjas. Yeah, it's the onion-cutting ninjas. Like, I, I felt them in here, too. Like, they're, they're just there. Like, I, I, could, I could... Sneaky bastards. <laughs> Prop game, Desperate Entertainment World. That, that is true as well. Like, and even then, like, admitting, sending up a couple dozen, right? And losing, God, two-thirds of that, right? Mmm, that's a hard thing. That's a hard thing to justify and to admit. I, I I could see that. But no, this was a this was a good video. And this is one of those unfortunate things that was just never taught. Not only was the Pacific Theater undertaught, in my opinion, this was very, very much glossed over. And that's unfortunate. This did in some way, I feel, lead to the Sorry, I'm having to find words. This did lead to an allied victory in the Pacific. And they were the only people that could have got that footage. Like, imagine if any other team went up there for that 22 minutes. And Matt, like, I don't think they would have made it out. Not with potentially up to a couple dozen specialized Mitsubishi aircraft on them. That is definitely undertaught. And this is... This has been nothing short of amazing, and I hope that hope that this was a good hour of your time. And at the very least, as well, I, I hope that you enjoyed learning something new if you didn't know about this story. But, alas, even more importantly, make sure, if you haven't, to go check out The Vital Electrician. He puts out a lot of great work. He puts out a lot of amazing work. And, you know, thank you, Fat Electrician, for continuing to put out just awesome stuff. You know, I know I react to a lot of it, and I definitely do my best to make sure that I'm segmenting out these uploads make sure to delay them a little bit i want to make sure your videos are getting pushed first and foremost and not any sort of rack content of it market replacement etc 
So thank you for everything that you do. This is awesome. And I love learning about not only military history, but history as well that really wasn't taught. You are a personable individual that teaches it in such a good way. And we need a lot more of that. We need a lot more a lot more people like you, Fat Electrician. <laughs> Sincerely a civilian. <laughs> But alas, what are your uh, what are your thoughts? Do you have any st uh, stories, family stories from this era? Obviously, observing OPSEC, right? Um, what did you uh, th did you get taught this in history class in in school, high school, college, etc.? Um, do you think that this led to a Allied victory? Uh, is there factual correlation to this leading to an Allied victory? Let me you know. Let me know all that in the uh, comment section. As always, definitely go check out the Battle Electrician. Absolutely awesome individual. Awesome content he puts out. And I will see you in the next one. So this has been an hour with Kip and Fat Electrician. Thank you everybody for watching. Get some water. Get some uh, sleep, rest, etc. I will see you in the next.